Normandy, 1944. This is the USGI, or General Purpose Infantryman. Opposing him is the German Grenadier. His weapons may be outdated, but he's a veteran of combat on many fronts. But the question still remains. Who is the better soldier? The well-equipped GI or the Panzer Grenadier? The U.S. Army is a formidable force. Their backbone is the U.S. GI. His equipment is among the most modern. New rifles, carabines, and helmets, as well as equally devastating antiques, such as the BAR, make the U.S. a formidable fighting force. Another advantage for the Americans was their abundance of jeeps, half-tracks, tanks, trucks, and all kinds of support weapons, especially Browning heavy machine guns and bazookas. The only thing U.S. troops lacked, however, was experience. The Germans were battle-hardened veterans, and their equipment was top-notch. Gewehr 43 rifles, Sturmgewehrs, and of course, Machine Gewehr 42 heavy machine guns were all proof of the Wehrmacht's power. However, most of these weapons were generally unavailable, and the Germans ended up mostly using outdated Car 98K rifles. A US squad contained 12 men. It was led by a sergeant who was helped by a corporal. They were usually armed with Thompson submachine guns. One or two men would have Browning automatic rifles, the squad's support weapons. The remaining 9 or 8 men would have M1 Garand semi-automatic rifles. Later in the war, some units would receive M1 carabines. However, this honor was usually reserved for airborne paratrooper units. A German squad was made up of 10 men. The NCO was either a Gefreiter or an Obergefreiter, and was issued a submachine gun. Under his command were 2 men manning the squad's late machine gun and 7 riflemen usually armed with Carabiner 98 Kurs rifles. Some of the luckiest squads were later issued Sturmgewehr assault rifles. This is my rifle! There are many like it, but this one is mine! My rifle is my best friend! Even with the development of automatic weapons, the rifle remained the most common weapon. You couldn't give everyone a machine gun, who would carry all the ammunition? And the machine guns were only effective at short range. The US had a long rifle tradition, and their army and weapons were largely influenced by this. The US was also known for mobile warfare, ever since their war for independence. Their standard issue rifle proved to be the best in the war. The M1 Garand was arguably one of the most important military innovations. A soldier didn't have to pull back a lever to get the gun ready to fire. The weapon did it for him. Near the end of the barrel, there was a small hole at the bottom. The gases which propelled the bullet were forced into it and went back through another tube. Once they came in contact with the gun's loading mechanism, they pushed it back and the bullet would load automatically. You could shoot as fast as you pulled the trigger. Uh, The Gewehr 43 was the German semi-automatic rifle and it worked using the same principles as the M1 Garand. 
It was also similar in terms of effectiveness to the American weapon. Unfortunately for the Germans, it wasn't produced in high amounts, and they ended up mostly using the outdated Core 98 ks These were bolt-action rifles, and you therefore needed to pull back a lever to fire it again. Here is a comparison of the firing speed. We can clearly see who had the better rifle, but luckily for the Germans, we can also clearly see who had the better squad support weapon. They're armed with the Nazis' devastating new weapon, the MG-42. It's the fastest firing machine gun in the world, double the speed of the American Browning machine gun. Its speed comes from its revolutionary design. In any gun, bullets are locked in place by a bolt. But the Germans discover that if the bolt runs on tiny rollers, it increases the loading speed of the bullet. It means the gun can fire up to 1,500 bullets per minute. By comparison, the US BAR, which you just saw in the hands of some random person, shot slower and carried less ammunition. Its only advantage was it was easier to carry it around. Some lucky squads might have got a light machine gun, but unless they were paratroopers, this was unlikely. Now we're down to submachine guns. These, however, were reserved for squad leaders and had a high rate of fire but a very short range. Some German platoons had a submachine gun armed assault squad, if you are an American private, you won't get one unless you are transferred to an airborne or special forces unit. The US Thompson was slightly more effective than the German M4. One German weapon surpassed every other, the legendary Sturmgewehr 44 assault rifle. Light, reliable, and effective at all ranges. The, the Americans were really lucky that few of these weapons were ever produced. The STG-44 is an assault rifle available for German infantrymen and is capable of switching between full auto and semi-auto firing mode. We are finished with the weapons and can conclude that the US equipment was a bit better. Now time for the most interesting section, tactics. We are back to our American squad. 12 men, represented by 12 dots. The squad was divided into three groups. Abel consisted of the sergeant and two people, one with a compass. They helped keep the squad on its path. Baker was the heavy weapons of the squad, such as bazookas and BARs. Finally, Charlie was the largest group, consisting solely of the corporal and the remaining riflemen. Here we have a hypothetical engagement between our American squad and the German heavy machine gun team. Please note that distance is not to scale. Firefights could happen from just a few feet away up to a whole mile. The battle begins with the machine gun opening fire. The suppressed Abel takes cover as Baker moves up to join them. In theory, the heavy weapons of Baker should be enough to suppress the enemy de decreasing their combat effectiveness. As this firefight takes place, Charlie moves around the flank undetected. They execute a flanking maneuver, which should be able to wipe out the enemy unit. This tactic might look good at first, but too many things can easily go wrong. The sergeant is in high danger at all times, and if the soldier manning the BAR is killed, it is very unlikely that the Americans can suppress the enemy. Plus, this is a three-man machine gun team, and the entire German squad is most likely nearby. In such a situation, someone would probably spot Charlie moving around the flank, and Jerry ain't gonna let that happen. In the ensuing firefight, Charlie has a high chance of wiping out their opponents thanks to their superior rifles. But by then, Abel Baker are probably already gone. And as I already said, the BARs aren't that great. If I was them, I'd either just run or play dead. It's possible the Americans have around half their squad left, 
but the Germans already know where they are. So an attack would be suicide. Therefore, a tactical retreat would be more likely. Well, if the GIs haven't routed by now. Plus, we completely forgot about one thing. Later Germans are very likely to have a second machine gun, which makes the Germans very likely to win both firefights, causing a complete rout. Of course, smoke screens might help, but American mortar support wasn't that extensive. Now the Germans are up. Ten men in two groups. A machine gun group, a rifle group, and a sergeant. All of those are self-explanatory. Here we see a similar tactic. However, the Germans have a few advantages. The machine gun design is very advanced, and probably will actually suppress their enemies. Plus, they have their grenades. A German soldier could carry up to six. The smaller ones wouldn't kill, but usually stunned. However, larger grenades were also in use. Germans could spring their cover, make a smoke grenade assault, then a regular grenade assault, and thanks to the later high inclusion of automatic weapons, have a good chance in close quarter combat. Of course, this has many of the limitations of the American tactic, so the Germans began to sometimes treat their entire unit as one machine gun team. The riflemen protected their machine gun, and fought on the front when it repositioned. They also had some nice tricks. Plus, their non-commissioned officers were much better trained, and showed way more initiative. A common deceptive trick is shown here, rolling over several times after hitting the ground. When the terrain seems suitable for this means of deception, watch out for it. We haven't even dealt with the double machine guns. This allowed for very effective crossfire, advance on both flanks, and exerted great stress on the enemy. In fact, this is the tactic which is used today by modern troops on all sides. Hopefully, by now you already see the German superiority. No vehicles were mentioned, as this opens a whole new level of tactics. So I guess the Germans deserve this Wehrmacht Taj for winning.